thing. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have a university degree? Anybody have a university degree? A bunch of people in this room? Okay. How many of you have ever studied something? Maybe not even with university. So in university you study, but maybe on Google or you tried to figure anything at all. Maybe not study, but you've tried to learn about something anywhere. Anybody learn about something, right? So I, I love YouTube. And this is how I learn. I watch YouTube videos, how, how to do things. So uh, some things I can pick up really good, and some things, no matter how many times I watch it, YouTube just breaks me. I don't know. It's, maybe it's their fault. Maybe it's my fault. So uh, a few months ago, as I was having a sale on juggling balls for a pound, right? So I said, man, I'm going to learn how to juggle. Because you ever been uh, at a party or you ever see somebody, they just grab three rocks and they start juggling. And then you see all the kids come around, that guy or that girl, and you're like, man, that is cool. I said, I'm going to I'm going to teach myself how to juggle because I want my daughter to stare at me. And I tried for like a day and I gave up. I just couldn't do it. Um, so last week, Mike was making balloon animals, right? And so he only knows how to make, I think it was two things, swords and hats, right? And so Lila kept saying, Mike, can you make me a crocodile? And she's like, oh, he's like, I can't do it. And she's like, can you make me a something else? And he's like, oh, I can't do it. So we get home and she was tired after another Monday and she says, Daddy, can you make me a crocodile? And I was like, all right. So I went on to YouTube. And you know what? They teach you how to make a crocodile. Then this time I have to blame the balloons because I was so close, right, Julie? And it didn't work, but, um, but it looked like a dog. So I just flipped it on. So she's like, oh, a dog. So she thought she had a dog all week long. So you can learn about anything. She bought this doll. It's not really a doll, but she bought this little toy. And I, I don't know the name of it, but it turns into a block. And so it was on sale because the box was broken that teaches you how to make it into this tiny little block. So she's like, Daddy, teach me how to do this. So I went on YouTube, man. I love it. I see, you see, we can learn about anything, and it, it turned into a block. Then she said, make into a guy again. I just can't be bothered. So if you want to figure out how to make this into a block, you know, come and find it without uh, breaking it. So um, people teach themselves and study because people want to become masters at thing. Uh, so I'm going to read this article. Some of you might think it's funny. Some of you might get a little embarrassed. But I thought it was funny because... You'd be surprised when you search online what people go to university for, what people study for, because when we're passionate about something, we want to learn about it. So let me read you this article. This is what it says. It says, hydrogen sulfide, commonly found in rotten eggs and human flatulence, could have significant health benefits in small doses, researchers at the University of Exeter say. So the article goes on to say that, you know, boiled eggs are human fatulence. If you don't know what that means, it's farting. Could be good. And, and the researchers have come out that said it could be good for stress. It could be good for cancer. It could be good for heart disease. And at the end of the article, this is what it says. So the next time someone lets one go in your presence, consider loudly thanking that person and letting the stink sink in before running in the other direction. Or since scientists have yet to confirm that smelling farts is as valuable as delivering their compounds straight to cells, at least remember to stop and appreciate that hydrogen sulfide isn't all that bad. Isn't that crazy? So somebody thought to themselves, I'm going to do research about this, and somebody somewhere is going to fund me to find out the effects of human flatulation in our bodies. You know, isn't that nuts? Like, so you think, and, and I think throughout... History, people have been studying things and learning things that we are passionate about or just we want to learn more about it. So the next 31 days through the month of August, we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel. And see, this is why we're going to be doing the book of Daniel, because when you look at his life, I think of somebody who's so full of faith, he's so full of passion, and throughout his life and throughout the, the, the 12 chapters in the book of Daniel, you see the power of God so active, so evident. And when I look at his life, I think to, our, to myself and, and hopefully for you as well, you say, you know what? If I spend time studying how to figure out this block to turn into this robot to turn into a block, if people take time to find out about human farting and how it's good for us, if people learn about balloon animals and, and programs and how to play the guitar, all these different areas that we're interested in, Surely we must be interested in the Word of God and what it can do in our lives. And as we look at the book of Daniel, and specifically, and you know, we'll go through a couple other guys as well, but his life, I want us to walk away saying, God, if we're passionate about growing in our walk with you, if we're passionate about learning more about you, if we're passionate about growing in our faith, 
then Lord, over the next few weeks as we look at his life, just challenge us to be even deeper. Can you guys say awesome? Awesome. Great, that's right. So that's what we're going to be doing. So let me give you a little bit of history about Daniel. Daniel was written in the 6th century. Oh, I forgot something. Oh, I got to do this. Julie's reminding me, I think. On every table, we have note cards. Some of you take notes on your phones. That's fine, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I want to trick you or convince you to take notes and to really learn. So this is what I'm going to do. Randomly throughout my notes, I have selected three questions. And I'm going to do this sound. Let's see. Does it play? The sound of a lion. So as soon as I do that, you got to know that I'm going to ask you a question about the stuff that I've been talking about. The first person to answer my question right gets a five-pound gift card to Starbucks. Is that cool, right? So if you, wanna, if you don't care, that's great. If you want a five-pound, take some notes, remember the questions, and hey, listen, I won't judge you. Nobody else will judge you because uh, the more, when you write something down, you remember it a little bit more. So whatever you want to do, grab some pens. I see people grabbing their notes. If you want some more Starbucks cards, that's what we're going to do. So listen for this sound. The roar of a lion. All right. Uh, Julie's handing out some cards. So let me tell you a little bit about Daniel. It was written in the 6th century B.C., and it's got main characters, and here they are. It's Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and Cyrus. So these are some of the main characters that you will see in the book of Daniel. And Daniel was written over 12 chapters, and the first six chapters of the book of Daniel all have to do with him being taken into captivity, and he served different kings. And through the first six chapters, you see this tremendous faith, and you see how God's hand is upon their lives. The next six chapters of the book of Daniel deal with four visions that God gave Daniel and about future events, not just in their time in the life of Israel, but also future events concerning the end time, so the end of the world. So it's written over 12 chapters. We're mainly going to concentrate on the first six six chapters of the book. And so we're going to look at this exile. And so as we dive into this, um, we want you to just be encouraged and again to, 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 to learn about what Daniel's doing. All right, who's ready? What year, what year was this book written in? Audrey. Sixth century. Audrey gets a five pounds. See, that was an easy one. See that? Quick hand up, and she wins five pounds. And Julie even left it on the board there. There it is. Good job, Audrey. So if anybody ever asks you when it was written, some of the other ones are a little bit harder. But let's read together the book of Daniel, chapter one. We're going to first read chapter one, the first 17 verses, to get a quick overview of this man's life. This is what it says. It says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim and Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon." The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin... Compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant 
who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of these 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends, they looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. Verse 16. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. So we're looking at this young man's life in this book for the next month. Because like I said earlier, if you're passionate about growing in your walk with God, then study his life. Because when you study his life and when you read about him going into the lion's den, when you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, the, in that blazing fire, when you see that God gives him the ability to not just interpret dreams, but to uh, um, tell the king what his dream was, you realize, wow, God, like you are on our side. You have our back. And we want to be encouraged and inspired throughout this month. So the next few weeks, what are we going to look at? What are we going to discover as we look at the life of Daniel? The first thing is this is that he was a man who found wisdom. For those of you who aren't sure, that's Albert Einstein, a very wise man, some might say. So when we look at the life of Daniel, he was a man who found wisdom. So he was first taken captive. He was a good-looking man. He was quick to understand. He was well-informed. As you read through this book, you see that he could make good decisions. Julie said this a few weeks ago. See, they renamed him and his friends. And if you know anything about this culture, I've talked about it before, but your name is like your identity. So his name was so important to him. And then all of a sudden, he goes into the captive of, of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And just because he was a slave now, Nebuchadnezzar says, listen, I'm going to change your name. So he changes all four of those young men's names. And you know what? Because he was wise, he just knew when it was time to shut up. So he didn't say anything about it because he said, listen, you can change me on the outside. But then all of a sudden, the king said, now we want you to eat our food because we want you to be healthy. And that's when, because of his wisdom, he knew when it was time to shut up and he knew when it was time to speak up. So he stops in the crowd and he says, listen, to the chief of, of, of the staff, he says, listen, if I eat any of this food, I'm going to defile my body. I cannot eat this food. Please, can you ask your king? If I, or he's like, can I please not eat your wines, not eat your food? Just give me vegetables. Just give me things that are grown in the ground. And I promise you that we will be healthier eating our stuff than eating your stuff. You know, you think about that. Sometimes we just need wisdom. He interprets dreams. He asks, God's, he asks God to show him what King Nebuchadnezzar's dream is. The book of Daniel is full of wisdom. You find out this man, you, you look at this man who knew how to find wisdom. I want you to say this. Say, I want to be wise. Can you say it again? Say, I want to be wise. How many of you have a desire when you learn about something to be dumber about that subject than when you first started learning it? Nobody, right? That would be silly to ask. See, Daniel, when you look at his life, he was quick to understand. He was quick to listen. He was passionate about getting more and more wisdom. What is wisdom? I looked it up. It says it's the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding. Wisdom is more than just following the rules. It's having the sense in your spirit to know when to act and when to just be quiet and just be humble. The Bible says this. It says, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gets understanding, that's Proverbs 3.13. Proverbs 24.13 says, My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. So someone who is wise just looks for these things, and it's like, wow, we want wisdom from God. We want to know more and more from God. Someone who is wise is someone who fears the Lord, who respects the Lord, who reveres the Lord, and not in, in like this way that's like when you fear God, it's like, oh, I'm just so afraid, but it's this act of respect and worship because you understand that he is in control of your life. 
Fear acknowledges that God has good intentions for us, all of us, no matter what we go through. And how do I know that Daniel is someone who, who found wisdom? Because he's humble. See, through all this time, he's being this young man who's smart, he's good looking, and you don't hear of him just kind of like, even when he talks to the king, he doesn't, go in there with, he doesn't go in with this brazen attitude, thinking he knows better or who he is. He, he goes in there with respect. He says, please, test me in this. Because when we're humble, it shows that we're wise. Because the Bible is full of scriptures that talks about how God resists the proud. So you said it. Every, I think everyone in this room said, I want to be wise. Well, that means that you have to look and you have to say, God, then make me humble. I need to be humble. I know I got to just keep my mouth quiet, Lord. Help me to just understand situations. Somebody else is wise is somebody who hears and does God's will. Somebody who's wise hears and does God's will. Well, how do you hear God and how do you do his will? We talk about it so often. It's by reading the Bible. It's by taking time to pray on your own and and not just talking to God, asking him for things, but listening, asking God what he wants you to do, because you never know where you're going to wind up. You never know what he's going to ask you to do, but somebody who's wise takes the time to do that more often than not. Somebody who's wise has discernment. Somebody who's wise has discernment. See, each and every one of us, we're going to be faced with decisions, and you're going to have to know what to do. And sometimes God's going to tell you to do it this way, and sometimes he's going to tell you to do it this way. People are going to come to your life, and they're going to ask you for advice, and they're going to ask you for your help. And when you think about it, what kind of ability and what kind of knowledge do you know? Because in our own ability, we are limited to the help that we can give. But when we trust God to hear his voice, to say, Lord, show me how to speak into a situation Some of us have major decisions in our life that we're faced with every day. Some of us bigger than others. Today, you might have something that's so big in your life, and you're thinking, God, I have no idea what to do. Well, someone who's wise asks for discernment, but you're saying, God, I just need your help, because I literally have no idea what to do, and if I don't make the right decision, and I just want to do what you want me to do. So somebody who's wise asks for discernment. Well, how do you get wisdom? You've got to desire it. So saying, I want to be wise, is awesome, and it's important. But is wisdom something that you desire? I desire a lot of things in life. I want a lot of things in life. And even as I was getting ready, and Julie's so awesome, she took Lila out this this morning and allowed me to just pray. And I was just kind of preparing for this. And I said, God, I don't pray for wisdom as much as I should. You know, I'm trying to lead this church, and I'm trying to do this. And wisdom is not just smarts. I have no university education, right? I, I did Bible school, and that's important, you know, and, and um, I, I, my graphic design, I, I, I literally, I, this is my life in a nutshell. I started working at McDonald's when I was 14, and I stopped going to church. I went on a missions trip when I was 20 years old, still working at McDonald's. God changed my life. I worked at McDonald's for another two years while serving in the church, and all of a sudden, somebody said, we want you to be a pastor. Let's do this. Me and Julie served for three years as pastors with still no Bible degree, just a passion to see people come to know Jesus. God comes knocking on our door and says, we want you to be missionaries to Scotland. We apply thinking we're going to get rejected. The doors keep opening. Seven years, na- seven years later, we have started a church in one of the toughest, most expensive cities in all of Europe. Here we are today, and your pastor doesn't have the smarts that it takes to do this. But you know what I do have? I just have a passion, and I have a God on my side who wants to give me wisdom. So you don't need to be smart. You don't need to be creative. You just have to want more of God in your life, and you have to desire wisdom. Because when you desire it, God opens up doors of impossible things in your life. You've got to desire wisdom. That's how you get it. You've got to read the Bible and apply it to our lives. You've got to pray for it. So so going from this desire to saying, God, come on, give me wisdom. Show me what to do. I just want to know you more and more. And how do you get wisdom? You've got to know Jesus. I met some of the brightest people in the world who are missing Jesus. And you know what? At the end of eternity, all their Bible knowledge and what they know is not going to get them into heaven. I know family members who know the Bible inside out, who know all the rules and who know all the translations, but yet they don't know Jesus. So their wisdom is put into the wrong place. If you want wisdom, you've got to know Jesus. So 
wisdom. Uh, Daniel is this book of a man who found wisdom. And what does wisdom lead to? My point number two, wisdom leads to favor. Proverbs 8.35 says this, For those who find me, it's talking about wisdom, find life and receive favor from the Lord. For those who find wisdom, find life and receive favor from the Lord. Ooh. All right, I'm going to ask you this question. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gets understanding. What proverb is that? Yes? You can say that unless anybody knows the exact proverbs. Close, 13. Yes, Jackie gets a five-pound gift card. Proverbs 3. Good job, Jackie. One more to go. So uh, wisdom leads to favor. So Daniel, he was a man who received favor. He received favor among the chief staff, you know, when he talked about his special diet. And the guy was afraid, but it says that the chief of staff, like, look favorably upon him and, and just for some reason wanted to trust him and, and, and just he liked something about Daniel. And he says, listen, Daniel, I know you want me to give you a different diet, but, but if I do that and you're more sickly than you are today, like, I'm going to lose my head. And Daniel says, please. And the guy says, all right, let me give it a go. See, I, I'm meeting the man who, who owns the, um, the, the theater that I've been praying for for like the last year, right, in Stockbridge. I'm meeting him on, on Monday. It's worth like a million pounds, right? And so I, I run into him all the time at Starbucks, and I see him on the street. I email him from time to time, and I'm just praying. I'm like, like how cool would it be? He walks in. He's like, man, stop nagging me. You want this building? Fine. Give me 5,000 pounds a year, and you can have it. You know, like, then I'd have to figure out how to pay for electricity. But still, if I got into a building, that would be one way. See, when you find wisdom, when you find wisdom, God, you receive favor. And it's not a favor that you can do in your own ability, but somehow God does that. What made this chief of staff say, I'm going to give you what you're asking for? Nothing except God just did something in this man's heart to look favorably upon Daniel. Then Daniel had favor above the king, Nebuchadnezzar. See, when you read on through these chapters in the book of Daniel, he goes to the king and the king says, listen, if you're so smart, I want you not to just interpret my dream, but you, I want you to tell me what my dream is. Think about that for a second. If I said to you, hey, I want you to tell me what I should do in this situation, but I actually want, I want you to tell me what the situation is. How crazy is that? I want you to double guess me. I want you to go into my mind and figure that out. So he had the presence of the king, and, the, and he says, listen, don't kill anybody yet. And he takes all of his own guys and he says, listen, pray for me because tonight I want to I wanna receive what that vision is. I want to know what your dream is. I want to know what it is, and I want to know the interpretation. See, that's favor from God because the king could have said, Right away, you're done. And then Daniel's this favored guy from the Lord. Like I said, he goes into the lion's den, and these hungry lions do not eat him. How many people are put in situations every day that your life's on the line, and yet, like, it happens, right? Like, I, when we have this special favor upon God, it's just like, I don't know, it's just amazing. Like, this guy was favored. And when I think about that, I say, God, I, I want your favor. Well, what is God's favor? What is God's favor? It's to give special regard to, to treat with goodwill, to show exceptional kindness towards someone. Favor is giving a person uh, preferential treatment. God loves everybody, but there are people who respond to quickly when they pray or need. And, and, and you think, ah, oh, you know, can you earn God's favor? Well, if it says if you find wisdom, then you're going to receive favor. And I looked at this, and Julie and I were talking about this last night. There are ways for you to, to get God's favor. There are. It happens. He loves everybody the same. But you know what? I've seen people in my life that when they ask for things, they just get it. Last year, I had a guest speaker, Paul Uliano. Paul and Haney are some of the most generous people I have ever met. And every time they give something away, God just blesses them, right? So last year, he's driving. He had a BMW. And God just said, I want you to give your BMW away. So he found the friend that God was talking to. I said, man, I'm sure God was not talking about me. You know, so he finds his friend, gives him a B&W, and somebody then gives him an Audi. Like, it was just amazing. So he knows the need. And, and you think, Paul came here 15 years ago as a missionary with no support like we did. He came with this passion to just start a church and, and just serve the people in Scotland. 
He lives in a beautiful home. He's got a great church. He's got a nice building. When I look at those guys' life, these guys are in tune with God, and for some reason, God's special favor is upon their life, and it just happens. He loves everybody the same. He loves the best person, the, the, the worst person. He loves us all, but there are people in life that he delights in, and, and I was trying to figure out, well, well why is that? Right? Why does he do that? And, 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 and there's this thing I was reading, and it said it's all about connection, right? When you're connected to God, and you have this relationship with God, compared to somebody who maybe just doesn't, not that there's a favoritism, but I, I don't know, do, do you see how that can work? Like, if I spend time in God's presence, not because I want anything from him, and not because I, I expect anything from him, but, but I'm like, God, I want to know you more. I just want to be in relationship with you. And, and he starts talking to me, and all of a sudden there's this connection that God and I have, right? Not to say he's going to give me everything I ask for, but I believe there's going to be like special favor on, on, on people's lives. I, I see this guy who started a church 13 years ago. And within six months, his church was running like 200. No, sorry, it's, it's eight years ago now. So eight years later, his church is running like 15,000 people, right? Eight years. So we're two years in. We've got about 20. We've got a long way to go. But it can happen, right? And I look at this man's life and his ministry, and for some reason, God found it favorable to bless him in his ministry. I don't know why, but it happens. Some people he does it for, some people he doesn't. But then I was reading Isaiah, and this is what it says in Isaiah 66. It says, these are the ones that I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. So this is God talking in Isaiah. He says, these are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. It goes back to that humility, wisdom. So, you know, the favor of God doesn't mean that we're never going to go through difficult times. It doesn't mean that we're going to get everything we ask for. It doesn't mean that God loves us anymore. Actually, you know what? When, when God's favor is upon your life, there's actually more responsibility. You know, it's not like a spoiled child who gets everything they want and they're terrible. When God's favor is upon your life, you know, when, when this guy's planting a church and he has a church of 13,000, God's favor is upon him, but that means there's more required from him for that special favor and blessing. If God blesses us financially, that means there's more required from us because of his special favor upon us. So as God looks at our lives and he blesses us with favor, there's actually more responsibility that comes with that. So how do I get his favor? You've got you to seek wisdom, and you've got to connect with God. Seek wisdom, and you've got to just connect with God. Connecting with God is the source of everything we have to do. Because when we connect with God, we, we ask for wisdom. When we connect with God, we receive favor. We've got this relationship that, that he longs for, and I believe it's what Daniel had, which is why he was able to do some of these amazing things. And the third point is this. When you look at the book of Daniel, he was a man who fought for his destiny. Daniel was a man who fought for his destiny. What was the name given to Daniel by King Nebuchadnezzar? Ruth. Oh, Belteshazzar. Good job, Ruth. That was a good one. You can stop taking notes. I'm just kidding. Daniel, he was a man who fought for his destiny. You like my little picture? It says, victory is mine. If you go back to the beginning of that chapter, it says this, right? It's in the beginning of that book. It says that the Lord allowed Daniel to, and, and, and the, the, king, the, the people of Judah to be taken captive and all the items of, the, of the, um, the palace of God's temple to be taken. It says that the Lord allowed that to happen. And see, Daniel is somebody who fought for his destiny. And how do I know this? is because he just didn't give up when times got tough. He didn't give up when he was taken into captivity. He said, I'm just going to do my very best. He says, because no matter what life looks like, there's a destiny and a purpose on my life. I don't care what you're going through in life. There is a destiny and purpose on your life. And if we want to learn from Daniel, then we've got to be people who fight for that destiny. We've got to be people to understand that there is a blessing, there is a calling, there is potential on each and every one of us. And depending on the day doesn't mean that your destiny or your purpose is, it should take 
time out, but you keep fighting for it. In every circumstance, in every situation, you say, God, I'm going to fight for this. When Daniel was in the lion's den, he said, I don't care what happens to me because I'm going to trust the Lord. And God rescued him from that situation because he's a man who fought for his destiny. When he was taken captive as a young boy who was good looking, who had his full life ahead of him. You know, when you're a young man, you're thinking, I want to get married. I want to just live a good life. I want to take care of my family, whatever happens. And all of a sudden, in a matter of moments that was changed, when the Babylonian king came and took him out of his home, but he said, I don't care what situation I'm in, I'm going to fight for my destiny because my God is in control. And the same God that, wants, that wanted Daniel to fight for his destiny is the same God who wants to, us to fight for our destinies too. Every day we're going to encounter something different, but are you going to give up on the dreams and the visions and the destiny that God has placed in our hearts? I was talking to a good friend this week. And we talk about, hey, this is great to have church, but one thing I never want us to forget and never mis- misunderstand is that Sunday afternoon from 4 to 5.15 is not the church. The church is every day that we live, every day that we're alive, every day that we're breathing, every person that we're around, this is our destiny, to be, to be the church 24 hours, 7 days a week. This is our destiny. Our destiny is to love people even when they don't deserve to be loved. Our destiny is to go out and make disciples. Our destiny is to connect with God. We have a destiny that's worth fighting for. We have a destiny that's worth living for. We have a destiny to see this community change with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you look at Daniel's life, this is what he did. He fought for it. I'm sure there was times where he was tired. We felt like giving up, but he said, God, I'm going to press in. I'm going to press on. Next week, we're going to look at Daniel and his friends and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how these guys survived the fiery furnace, but somehow God did it. But as we get into this book and as we look at the life of Daniel, he was a man who found wisdom. He was a man who received favor, and he was a man who fought for his destiny. And as we look over the next six chapters, I I believe those three elements, and obviously others as well, kind of led this man to have such a fantastic, fulfilled life serving God Almighty. And that is the same God that many of us serve today. Why don't you stand with me as I get ready to close in prayer? Lord Jesus... We just ask you, Lord, that you would give us just all in this room just a little bit more wisdom. God, we just ask that you would just help us, Father God. We, we need wisdom, Lord. We, we, we want your favor, Lord. And Jesus, we, we need to be reminded every day that our destiny as believers is something to fight for. God, there's a world out there that needs you. There's family members that need you. There are people, Lord God, and friends and coworkers and, and, and students and, and strangers, Lord, that, that need you. Lord. Help us to never get tired to fight for what you've called us for. And God, as we look at his life and as we study and unravel the life of Daniel, God, that we would grow in our walk with you. Jesus, I pray that we would get hungry for for what you want us to be hungry for. I pray that we would just know you passionately more and more each day. And God, as we go about our days and and we take time reading books, you know, fiction and other things, Lord, and and we study so much, Lord, I pray that we never forget to take the time to study your word. And God, give us, remind us throughout this week to read the book of Daniel for ourselves and to see what you're teaching us in our own lives. God, thank you for a great afternoon here today. Lord, we just pray that you would bless us, that you keep us all safe, Lord, as we travel home. We look forward to a great Wednesday together, a a, a great Saturday reaching out to our community until we come back next Sunday.